Hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm here on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening I should say, in my Brooklyn apartment, and it's a lovely day. And I'm sitting here, and I'm happy to be talking to all of you. And there are so many things for us to discuss. So many things happening in the world. I want to take this opportunity, real quick, to let you know that you all are ahead of the game. You all are way ahead of the game. Why? Why are you ahead of the game? Well, if you haven't noticed, a couple days ago, the Washington Post decided to run an article about something that all of you that watch these lives already knew about a long time ago. And that would be Karl Marx's relationship with Abraham Lincoln. That's right. I, being someone who has studied Marxism and studied the history of socialism, get very annoyed when I see the likes of Dinesh D'Souza and right-wing conservatives uh, invoke Abraham Lincoln, say things to the effect of, well, the Democrats were the party of slavery because they were Marxists, just like Hitler. You know, these ignorant statements that they make. And so, um, in response to that, uh, I have made many videos talking about Abraham Lincoln. In fact, I even put up a clip from the movie Lincoln in Illinois, the 1930s movie. And I put that clip up. And so you all have known about the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Karl Marx for a long time. You all have known that. Well, now the Washington Post has caught up with you. The Washington Post now knows what was common knowledge to anyone who watches these lives. So welcome, welcome. I'm shouting out to Eve. I'm shouting out to Lisa Hauserman. I'm shouting out to somebody named Jason. I am shouting out to all of you who are joining us this afternoon. So much for us to discuss. Uh, didn't Abe Lincoln chop down a kiwi tree? No. Uh, George Washington allegedly chopped down a cherry tree, but apparently that's just a myth. But I'm seeing all kinds of you. Kinky is with us. The inundation is with us. Who else is with us? Wow. It's a great afternoon. I'm happy to talk to you all. So many things that we can talk about. I'm fired up to talk about a lot of things. We're a little community here. I really do think that, right? We do this every week, not always on Saturdays, sometimes it's on Sundays, but we make a point of talking. Um, someone's talking about Prometheus, someone's talking about Phantom Starfish, JT24, shout out to you, JT24, glad you're joining us. Wow, shout out to Tyler Woodby, shout out to Lincolnite Yankee, shout out to Joe Howard, glad you all are joining us. Wow, what a day it is, and, Baby On is here. Shout out to you. Christopher Simanchik is here. Shout out to you. Blood Money LC is here. Wow, so much that we can talk about. If you haven't done it already, folks, if you haven't done it already, now is the time to cut and paste this link into your Facebook, Twitter. Make this a bigger conversation. Put on there, oh my God, I can't believe what Caleb Maupin just said. He's going and going and going. Join the conversation. Get all your friends to join us. We are having a great, great time. Now, Kinky is telling me that she really enjoyed my interview with Graham Elwood. And I think it went very well. I've known Graham for a little while. Great guy. Um, I mean, he's a comedian. Uh, he, he does politically and socially conscious humor. Good stuff, um, and he's been in Hollywood for a long time, and, and we had a great discussion. I think it went really well. So if you haven't had a chance to tune in and watch it, I would check out that interview, because we talked about all kinds of things. We talked about Superman, we talked about oil, and the oil markets, uh, we talked about, oh, what else did we talk about? We talked about all kinds of stuff. We talked about China, we talked about uh, computers, we talked about comedy and movies. I mean, we talked about all kinds of stuff, Graham Elwood and I. So if you haven't seen my conversation, my 25, 35 minute chat with Graham Elwood, the comedian, uh, check it out. Uh, it's on his YouTube channel. I'll probably post it on, on my channel in a few days. But you ought to watch it on his channel because it's quite a happening channel that he's got over there at Graham Elwood, Political Vigilante. Now, Donnie Wallace is saying Caleb Maupin for president. Well, I have no political aspirations at this time. As a journalist, I am required and it is ob my obligation to not be involved in the political process, to maintain an objective view of Thing. So I don't endorse any candidate. People will know there are things I like about Bernie Sanders. People will know there are things I like about Andrew Yang. People will know there are things I like about Tulsi Gabbard. People will know there are even things I like about Marion Williamson. I'll even say that. Tough for me to admit. There are things I like about a lot of different candidates, but I don't endorse any of them. And for all of them, 
there are some legit criticisms. So I just, um, I just, I just keep it real. I just do what I got to do. I spread the truth in a world of lies. I try to promote a scientific understanding of the world and the world economy and how it works. So shout out to I see someone named Alex is joining us. Great. I see someone named Varathius is with us. Um, wow, this is a great live. Uh, Dan Uko says, Caleb, what are your thoughts on China and Taiwan and your thoughts on the recent Japanese election? Well, I will answer your question this way, Uko, Dan Uko. Taiwan is China. Let me repeat. Taiwan is China. Taiwan is China. In fact, the name of the government on Taiwan is Republic of China. So let's be very clear about this. Taiwan is China, right? And Taiwan has always been part of China. It is a province of China, right? At this point, uh, there is a government on Taiwan that is separate from the People's Republic on the mainland. Um, and for a long time in the United Nations, uh, the United States recognized the government on Taiwan as representing the entire Chinese mainland, right? That was not good. That was not a good policy. The USA did that. The UN did that. Changed in the 70s, thank goodness. But that was a very mistaken policy. And now what disturbs me is I'm seeing the Trump administration getting itself closer to forces aligned with the, the LDP and Taiwan separatist elements in Taiwan. And that is an attack on China, right? China has a good relationship with the KMT at this point. Obviously, they, they you know, the People's Republic was created in a war with the KMT, but that's, that's history, right? Now, the Chinese Communist Party and the KMT, they have an understanding with each other. They both recognize that Taiwan is China. However, there are these fanatically anti-communist separatist forces that want Taiwan to declare that it is not China, to declare independence, to denounce its relationship with the mainland. And that is something that I'll tell you a lot of people, a lot of people would not approve of, right? And I'm not just talking people that are sympathizers of the Chinese Communist Party. There are a lot of people in Taiwan who say, I am Chinese, and there are a lot of people around the world who don't agree with the Chinese Communist Party, but say Taiwan is China, right? It was Henry Kissinger, as much as I don't like Henry Kissinger, that is one thing he did change. He ended the policy of the United States claiming that the government on Taiwan represented all of China um, and enacted the one China policy, recognizing that Taiwan and China are one country. Um, and that was big. Um, and it certainly disturbs me to see the Trump administration selling a lot of weapons to Taiwan um, and seemingly trying to, to look almost as if it hasn't done it yet. We still, the, the China, the one China policy seems to still be in effect, but there was that phone call before Trump took office, uh, and, and it's a little bit nerve-wracking. And so I will say I'm a little bit nervous about that. But the main thing is we want peace. Obviously, we don't want any kind of military confrontation to take place, right? Um, you know, that would be a disaster. I mean, it would be a disaster for, for China to have Chinese people killing Chinese people. And, and, any kind of confrontation that would take place would be, you know, you know, fomented by the West. Um, now, uh, Civic Matters is saying, I am a Taiwanese Australian in the USA. I got a cousin in China who is an army officer, was a reservist. Um, very good. I mean, this is a real thing. These are real people that are involved. And, you know, I, I don't think that the Chinese Communist Party has any desire to go and invade, uh, invade uh, the, the Taiwan province. I think there's an understanding uh, between the, the KMT and the Taiwan government and the mainland, and let's hope that that can stay intact and these separatist forces don't get the upper hand, because that could cause a lot of problems around the world, right? And that would be a disaster. So uh, I hope that answers your question, Dan Uko. Um, uh, there you go. Now, I know that there are a lot of things on people's mind, but we're talking China at the moment. And so, just wanted to throw this out there, because whenever, Whenever you hear anything in American media about economics, it is so loaded with bias. So loaded with bias. There is just no attempt at objectivity. Folks, last year, China's GDP growth rate, the GDP growth rate of the People's Republic of China for 2018 was 6.9%. 6.9%. That was their rate of gross domestic product growth. And the U.S. media said, aha, the Chinese economy is crashing. 
That, this is the first time their growth rate has not been 7% since the 1980s. This is the end. The end of the Chinese economy, 6.9%. That's tiny. It's not even 7%. China is crashing and burning. The Chinese economy is crashing and falling. The great Chinese Titanic is sinking. The Hindenburg of the Chinese economy is about to explode. This is the end, 6.9%. How do they do it? So today... Being the, the smart guy I am, I was reading the Wall Street Journal. They put it on the back of the front page. Economic, economic, or economy misses 2018 growth target. We missed our growth target here in the United States. And what was the GDP growth rate in the United States for 2018? The total output for 2018, economy grew at 2.9%. So China is crashing and burning, and it's the end. It's the end because they have 6.9%. But we're struggling. Donald Trump said that the target growth would be 3%, and we haven't hit it. I'm reading this. This is you can't make this up. The average rate of growth GDP for the United States from 2013 to 2018 was 2.5%. Up from an earlier estimate of 2.4%. Can you make this up, folks? Right? Trump says we're in an economic miracle and we can't even reach a growth rate target of 3%. And U.S. media goes along with this. Hey, unemployment is low. Hey, wages are kind of sort of rising maybe. I don't know. I, they go along with this, right? And then China has 6.9% growth rate. And we're supposed to believe it's the end. I mean, they're crashing and burning. Can, can it be any more, any more biased? Can it be any more biased than that? U.S. economists would kill would kill for a 6.9% growth rate, right? That would be double, more than double, the rate of economic growth we are having right now in the United States. If we at this point had a 6.9% growth rate, your standard of living would be going up at twice the rate it's supposedly going up right now, right? A 6.9% growth rate in the United States would be amazing. We've not had something like that in decades. But apparently, China having it proves their economy is crashing, and we're in the middle, according to Donald Trump. According to Donald Trump, we're in the middle of an economic miracle. Tell me, folks, is it an economic miracle in your neighborhood right now? Right? Everything's just prosperous. People have loads of stuff. Their wages are all going up. People are spending money. It's happy, happy, fun times. We are not in an economic miracle, my friends, when our roads are not being paved. We're not in an economic miracle when water isn't being properly purified. We are not in an economic miracle when the younger generation is stuck in a lifelong cycle of low-wage service sector jobs. We are not in an economic miracle. Wall Street is having an economic miracle right now. The profits of Wall Street bankers and corporations are going through the roof. And the reason for that is that Trump lifted a lot of the Obama-era regulations. He's allowing drilling, for example, on public lands. Uh, he has lifted taxes uh, the, on Wall Street, uh, you know, and folks you know, in, the, in the top 1% are paying, you know, are paying less taxes. So Wall Street's profits are going through the roof, but average Americans are not seeing their lives getting better. You know that's true. I know that's true. Look out your window. Walk through your neighborhood. We are not in the middle of an economic miracle by any stretch of the imagination. Shout out to Jenny Lynn, who is joining us. Welcome, welcome. We're not, we're not in an economic miracle by any stretch of the imagination. It's just not happening. And, and the fact that we have President Trump saying we're in the middle of an economic miracle and we can't even reach the target rate of growth of 3%. I mean, what am I telling you folks? I mean, they're talking about a slowdown. There is a manufacturing output slowdown going down, going on now. But wait till that hits spending. The job numbers, they're saying they're so great, but are they really what they should be? Folks, we have some reasons to be concerned. And I got to tell you, whenever they talk about economics in the United States, it's beyond me, 
the level of bias is massive, right? If you can think that China having 6.9% growth rate proves their economy is crashing and burning, and the USA is having an economic miracle with 2.3% or 2.4% or 2.5%, um, yeah, yeah. The bias is pretty, pretty extreme. I'm going to get into that later. I'm going to read to you from my new book, and we're going to talk about some different stuff. we got plenty of stuff to talk about today. Plenty, plenty on our minds. So, one thing that I know folks will be interested in, especially if you watch this live. So, I don't know if folks saw, but in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, right, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, has been moving in to kind of be the authoritarian leader who's restructuring the Saudi economy. He's cutting off a lot of people's heads, a lot of public beheadings, um, and and he you know has rounded up. At one point, he was holding all a lot of the members of the royal family who were charged with corruption. He was detaining them in this hotel and and allegedly torturing them. Um, you know, and that that Saudi Arabia is having a bit of a shakeup, right? Jamal Khashoggi, that incident we know about. We know about the ongoing onslaught against Yemen, where people are being bombed and killed in Yemen. Saudi Arabia is having a shakeup. And Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, the son of the king, the king is old, he's like in his 70s, he's kind of just a figurehead, but it's the crown prince, his son, who's ruling. And the crown prince is desperately trying to restructure the Saudi economy. And he has just announced this project to restructure the Saudi economy and it's called Neom. Neom. And if you listen to it, he's trying to turn one particular region of Saudi Arabia that doesn't have much there, other than like salt and access to seawater and sand. He's trying to turn it into like a model city. And, and the Wall Street Journal, which is partially owned by Saudi Arabia, you know, they go and great detail, you know, talking about how amazing his economic plan is for Neom. And I guess Neom is a word, it's it's a play on an Arabic word that means future, and a Greek word uh, that means uh, hope, or it means, what does it mean? It's a Greek word that means, you know, progress or something like that. And it's this project, the king is trying to turn this, this section. It's a Greek word that means, or it's an, a Greek word that means new, and an Arabic word that means future, the Neom. He's going to turn this region of Saudi Arabia into a vibrant sector of industry. What's this about? Folks, this is about the fact that Saudi Arabia is weaker than it has been in decades. Weaker than it has been in decades. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, right? It's the, it's the monarchy. It's the House of Saud. And the House of Saud, they were one faction one ruling family, one monarchy on the Arabian Peninsula, but they began working with the British Empire, right? At the time, lead up to World War I, as World War I was breaking out, the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, the Ottomans, were aligned with the Germans, were aligned with the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and so the British backed the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I don't know if folks have ever seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia, classic Hollywood movie. It's about T.E. Lawrence, Thomas Edward Lawrence, uh, who was the British intelligence officer who worked with the Arabs to foment, lead them into battle against the Turks. Very famous. But the British began arming the House of Saud, and there was the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was a secret treaty in which the French and the British and, and other great powers divided up the Middle East between different, different ruling families and monarchies and the borders of the Arab world that we now know, right, like Kuwait and Syria and... All of those were drawn up in this secret treaty called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was to be enacted after the end of the First World War. And the, it was the Bolsheviks who made it public because the Russians knew about it, but it was a secret treaty. When the Bolsheviks took power in Russia, they revealed this secret treaty that showed that the Arab people, which are one nation, right? There is one Arab people, right? And the, the Arabs are one nation, whether they're Saudis, whether they're Iraqis, whether they're Syrians, there is one Arab nation. Um, but it showed how the British and the Americans and the French were carving up the Arab world into different little spheres and protectorates. They gave the French Syria, they gave the British Iraq, you know, and the House of Saud was selected to rule over that big chunk of the Arabian Peninsula that we now call Saudi Arabia. And the House of Saud was known for being just brutal. And, I mean, they had an interpretation of the Islamic faith called Wahhabism, uh, it's, it's the most fundamentalist and extreme. They try to keep alive the political system of the 1400s. 
And and that was that was how the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia came to to rule over that part of the Arabian Peninsula. They'd been around, the House of Saud had been around, but there was the British and and later the Americans that signed a treaty with them and ultimately made them the de facto, kind of appointed them to be the de facto rulers of the Arabian Peninsula. And for a long time, we were kind of in a weak spot. The United States, I should say, was in a weak spot in relation in relation to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Why? Because we had very little domestic oil in the United States. In 1973, there was the OPEC boycott, where the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and another number of Arab countries, you know, were not sending oil, were briefly not sending oil to the United States, and it was a disaster. The price of gasoline went through the roof, people were lined up for blocks to get gasoline, we passed a, an oil export ban so that no one could send oil outside the United States, you know, and, and it was a disaster when the Arab countries stopped sending oil to the United States. But then, fast forward a few decades, we now have this thing called fracking, hydraulic fracking, which is a very bad practice environmentally. It leads to people being poisoned, right? You can see people lighting their, their sinks on fire. Um, it's, it's not good for the water supply, it's not good for people living in houses near fracking, but hydraulic fracking has resulted in a huge, huge boom in oil within the United States. There is more oil now being produced in the United States than ever before. And because of that, we don't need the Saudis like we once did. If, if there was another oil export, OPEC, you know, OPEC, if OPEC boycott happened again, if the Saudis stopped selling oil to the United States, we'd be all right. We'd just start using the oil from fracking here. And they know that. And on top of that, within Saudi Arabia itself, there are a lot of people who are being oppressed. Shiite Muslims or Shia Muslims in Saudi Arabia they don't have human rights. They are not allowed to work in any job that doesn't, you know, involve manual labor. Uh, their right to have routine religious services is not permitted, and they face a huge amount of discrimination. Um, the the leader of the peaceful protests among the Shia Muslims in in the Arab Spring was beheaded, Sheikh Namir al Namir. Just horrendous stuff. Ayatollah Namir al Namir, I believe. Just horrendous stuff. Um, you know, in Saudi Arabia is one of the countries in the world where there's no notion of civil rights. I mean, they don't have elections. They have a king who is, who is the king. It's a hereditary monarchy. They have public beheadings. People get beheaded for crimes like sorcery, for crimes like insulting the king, crimes like uh, disturbing the peace in the kingdom. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty repressive, awful regime known for torture, known for all kinds of things. It sends weapons all over the world. And right now it's in a little bit of a crisis because it realize, realizes that the United States is not dependent on them as it once was. And so it appears to me that Mohammed bin Salman is trying to, on some level, be a little bit of a Bonapartist. There's a fear that those Shiite oil workers in Saudi Arabia will rise up. There is a fear that you know, there's a lot of guest worker slaves in Saudi Arabia, people from Bangladesh, people from the Philippines, who have no human rights whatsoever and, and are worked to death and, and are just treated horrifically. There's a fear within Saudi Arabia that something's going to bust open, right? And that there's been this crackdown on corruption, and now Mohammed bin Salman's announcing, yes, he is going to turn this Neom. He's going to make this model region of Neom. And he's going to make it, you know, just a prosperous, happy, happy, fun area full of robotic dinosaurs. I'm not making this up. Robotic dinosaurs and all kinds of stuff. It's going to be, he, the king, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, is going to turn the Neom region into, uh, you know, a great, happy, fun model city full of robots and dinosaurs and high-tech companies. And, yeah, crazy. And I think what's going on here is that there is a desire on the part of, of certain elements in the United States and certain elements in big oil to try and stabilize Saudi Arabia because there is a fear that things in Saudi Arabia could come apart really quick, right? We know what happened in 1979 with Iran. They thought they had a puppet regime. They thought they had a regime that would just let them take the oil and all of a sudden there was an explosion and now we have the Islamic Republic of Iran. There is a fear. There is a fear that Saudi Arabia, due to its changing position in the world economy, due to the economic shakeup, due to the fact uh, that, that the Shiite oil workers aren't just going to take this anymore, due to the fact that the way they treat guest worker slaves is, is unacceptable. I think there's a fear 
that Saudi Arabia could bust open and that there could be some kind of massive uprising in Saudi Arabia. And you'll notice that support for Saudi Arabia used to be unquestioned. It used to be Democrats, Republicans, they all loved Saudi Arabia, end of discussion. But you'll notice since the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, there is a renewed kind of distrust of Saudi Arabia, mainly from Democrats, but also from Republicans. Now, there are many voices in the United States that suddenly don't like Saudi Arabia. Before, they were kind of untouchable. It was just kind of unacknowledged. The USA would invade Iraq because it's, oh, it's not a democracy, Saddam is a dictator, and then Saudi Arabia, yeah, you know, we don't talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's over. It seems to me that there are now forces widespread in the U.S. establishment that say, why are we selling these people weapons? Why are we buying their oil when we don't need it anymore? So Saudi Arabia is in a, a desperate spot of trying to stabilize itself. And so we have this crackdown on corruption, and now we have this plan to build this model region of Neom or Neom or Neom or whatever it is. I think what this is about, this is a sign of desperation. When societies are very stable, there's no need for this. The fact that there has been such big crackdowns on corruption, the fact that there have been so many public beheadings, the fact that there, there is now this effort to build a model region with ro mo model robots made out of robot dinosaurs and all of this, this is desperation from the Saudi regime. I don't know if folks saw, I did a TV report a few months back about how the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia put out a magazine to make Americans like them. I kid you not, they put out a magazine, a magazine, the New Kingdom, and they paid for it to go on newsstands to convince everybody that Saudi Arabia was great. And they had an old article, we let women drive now. It's the new kingdom, not the old kingdom. Oh, and it was like, it was paid advertising, right? Why do they need to do that? Because they're desperate. I smell desperation from the House of Saud. There is, there is something rotten in Riyadh. There is something rotten in Riyadh. I'd say there's been something rotten in Riyadh for a long time, but there's something, something abnormal in Riyadh. Things within the Saudi kingdom are not going well. I'm telling you that. This is, this is some behavior from the Saudi monarchy, from the crown prince, from the king that we have not seen before. Something, something's going on here. And the fact that there are so many voices within the American power structure that don't like the Saudis anymore. The fact that Trump is defensive about his support for the Saudis. The fact that the Saudis are coming out with weird economic development plans. Something's happening here. Something's happening here, right? It seems to me like the crown prince is trying to be a bit of a Bonapartist. He's, you know, if you read on paper, these Neom plans remind you of what Park Chung-hee did or what the, uh, the, the, uh, the ruler of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, did, uh, you know, kind of state-directed economic development. Um, it's kind of a, a desperate measure. Saudi society seems very, very unstable. But what else is new, folks? I've talked about Saudi Arabia for a little while here. What, what else is new? What am I missing? I see all kinds of comments going through in the blog. What's happening, folks? What's on your mind? I know you all have things you want to talk about. And if you haven't subscribed, now is the time to push the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, now is the time to hit that bell next to the subscribe button. You see that bell? Click on it. Click on it so you get a notification. We want you all here, right? Caleb, would you like, what would socialist revolution look like in the U.S.? What should American, wow, that's an interesting question. Well, I've, I've addressed that before. Um, maybe I'll get to that a little bit later, but that's interesting. I'm not on here promoting revolution. I'm on here talking about the world and giving you an analysis as I, as I see it. Um, the targets of imperialism aren't getting a break or much breathing room under Trump, though. Uh, what else is new, folks? What else is new? What else is going on in the world? What else is on people's minds? Progressives in Congress voting for HR, yes, a, a law that would make it illegal to boycott Israel. Well, I'm sorry. I think I can boycott whoever I want. I am, I am allowed to boycott whoever I want. Folks, uh, you know, there's a lot of criticism of Gandhi out there. But what did Gandhi, what was that all about, right? Gandhi is so loved. What was Gandhi about? He was boycotting British salt, right? That was what he was fighting for the right to do. The British told Gandhi that, oh no, told the people of India, they weren't allowed to boil salt water. They weren't allowed to boil salt water. They had to buy their salt from the British. It was illegal. And so Gandhi, to make a point, got his boiling water and right there in front of the British troops, he boiled water to get his own salt, right? You're allowed to boycott whoever you want. You're allowed to boycott 
whoever you want. I, I am deeply disturbed by that bill. I think you are allowed to boycott whoever you want, and, and it is just deeply problematic to see, to see this even being discussed. Um, but what else is happening, folks? I've got other things to talk about. Um, you know, plenty of things going on. Folks, folks, one thing that I, I, I've always been a little bit worried about, I've always not, I, you know, you have to be careful. When, when you criticize works of art, like movies, like books, when you criticize things like that, you have to be careful. Because there are a lot of people that if you criticize their favorite book or their favorite movie, they take it very personally. Right? I had a friend, you know, and I criticized the Harry Potter books from a political perspective. I said, well, I, I argued that they were putting forward kind of a political view that I didn't agree with. And you would have thought I had insulted a member of her family or it was, you know, people get defensive. So you have to be careful. But I think that you can love a work of art. I think that you can love a work of art and not agree with it. You can recognize the political message of a work of art and not agree with it. I think that's, that's very possible. And that it's important when you go to the movies, it's important when you, you know, read a book, the work of fiction, it's important when you go to a play or you listen to music to have your political ears on. Listen to what the message is. Um, because that's how politics is disseminated. Popular culture has far bigger of an influence. A lot more people, you know, watch popular movies than, than read political books. And you can enjoy, you can love a work of art and say, this is amazing, this is artistically amazing, and not agree with it. You know, just because you can like it aesthetically and not agree with it. A lot of people love Wagner's music, for example. I love Wagner's music. Politically, I don't agree with Wagner. Very bigoted, very hateful, very anti-Semitic. I don't agree with Wagner, but his music is amazing, right? I can, I can, I can disagree with the message of a work of art, and still enjoy it aesthetically. And that's important, right? That, that you can recognize that a work of art has a problematic political message and you can still enjoy it, right? Enjoy it aesthetically, but criticize it politically. And that needs to be done. Now, the new Lion King movie is out, right? The new Lion King movie is out. I haven't seen it. I did see the original Lion King quite a few times when I was a kid. It was the movie in the 1990s. That and Aladdin. Did see the new Aladdin. Haven't seen the new Lion King. Don't know if I will. Um, but one thing I will say about the Lion King, you know, and you can look into it and read into it. I know some people say that, well, no, actually, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's preserving the monarchy and that, uh, and that uh, you know, Scar is fighting for the oppressed, you know, hyenas. And, and, you know, people read a lot of different politics in it. But one thing I will say pet peeve of mine. Every English teacher in high school seems to have told everyone I know that Hamlet, the plot of Hamlet, is the same as The Lion King. And it's not. The play Hamlet by William Shakespeare, one of the greatest works of literature in the English language, is not the same as The Lion King by far. There are a couple similarities, but it's not the same. It's not the same. And I've heard this from so many people. You'll say, oh, you know, you know, the Lion King. Oh, you know, the Lion King is Hamlet. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. Okay. The Lion King starts out with Simba being very happy, has the, you know, the dad who's the king. They're getting along great. Eventually the king dies. Simba's cast out of the kingdom and eventually comes back to reclaim his throne. Hamlet starts with the king already dead and a ghost coming back to Hamlet and saying that his father was actually murdered when he thought his father had died of natural causes. And then Hamlet proceeds to spend the whole play trying to figure out what he should do. Should he take revenge or not? And it destroys him. And it's, you know, and that, you know, his love, Ophelia, ends up committing suicide. And it's this knowledge. He's cursed with this knowledge. He's cursed with the knowledge that his father was murdered and it destroys his family and it destroys him and it destroys everybody. That's basically the message. And Hamlet spends the play walking around being depressed and wishing he didn't know. You know, that's kind of the mess. That's Hamlet. That is not the Lion King. No, you know, the Lion King is not the same story. And I, I, I feel like that's something that some English teacher thought up. Okay, yes, we've got a son whose father is killed by a brother. That's about it. That's about it. 
right? The ending is completely different. The plot is different. Simba doesn't spend the whole play walking around going, oh, should I take revenge? I wish I didn't know this. Maybe it's not real. No, that doesn't happen, right? It's, it's, it's not the same story. And this is a cliche. I get annoyed with cliches. Because I feel like anyone who's familiar with Hamlet, who really knows the story of Hamlet, and anyone who really knows the story of The Lion King, knows that they are not the same at all. But people just kind of say this. Their English teacher said it. It was a clever thing. Well, don't you know, The Lion King is Hamlet. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. I, I, that's just an annoyance I've had my whole life. I, I really do. Um, you know, and Jenny Lynn is saying, and Walt Disney was a Nazi sympathizer. That's true, by the way. Um, that, that, is, that is very true. Now, kings and queens are reactionary anyhow, says Stephen Schneider. Yes, I, I would agree. That's a holdover from feudalism, the, the monarchy, uh, the monarchical system. Um, Civic Matters is laughing. Um, someone says, read Michael Parenti. Prometheus is asking me thoughts on the next recession and its causes. Wow, that I can talk about, um, you know, about automation and all of that. But while we're on this thing about works of art, so... I did. I haven't seen the new Lion King. Not sure I will. I did go see uh, yesterday, and I saw it yesterday. But um, but but no, I saw this yesterday movie. This this movie about what if the Beatles, you know, this, the world like blinks and all of a sudden everyone's forgotten the Beatles, and there's one guy who knows about the Beatles, so he he starts performing their songs as if they're his own. I saw that. Clever premise for a movie. Right? It is a clever premise uh, for a movie. Right? The idea that the Beatles would just kind of be erased. Um, you know, and what, what would the world be like and how, you know, he knows it. And he, I mean, it's a clever premise. Beyond that, it was a little bit predictable. It was kind of like every episode of Seinfeld that starts out with a little lie and then eventually and eventually and event, you know, right. We know about that. Um, you know, it was a little bit predictable. It was more of a romance movie. Um, a lot of Beatles songs in it. I mean, they managed to get every single Beatles song in there. They didn't play the whole thing. They managed to get every little Beatles song in there that you ever heard. Um, I will say though that. You know, when I was watching it, I, I, I had kind of an amusing thought, right? So, the, the premise of the movie, there's a big power failure on Earth one day. All the lights go out everywhere. And when the lights come back on, everyone has forgotten all about the Beatles. And I thought, hmm. And it's like the Beatles had never existed. And I thought, hmm. That would probably mean the Soviet Union came back. Think about it. That would probably mean if the Beatles had never existed, the Soviet Union would probably still exist, right? That's a provocative thing to say. That probably surprises you. You're probably thinking now, Caleb, how in the world are you saying that an American rock band, an American, uh, I'm sorry, a British rock band, a British rock band, which I like, I enjoy Beatles music, I, I do, um, but how are you saying that a, an American Beatles, you know, American, British rock and roll phenomenon. You know, if they never existed, that that would change world history so much. Well, I'm sorry, look into the late Cold War. Look into the late Cold War, folks. Right? The Beatles. Right? Beatlemania. And the influence of blue jeans. And rock and roll. And hippie counterculture. That stuff played a big, big role in the overturn of the Soviet Union. Right? Soviet society, right? It had become very conservative out of necessity. These countries were surrounded, all the Eastern Bloc, they were spending a lot of money on militarism, and they had become very conservative. And the Beatles, and Jackson Pollock, and all kinds of Western art was very key in changing the image of Western capitalism. Right? Read about the Congress for Cultural Freedom. This is what the CIA considers to be one of its most successful programs. They brag about it on their website. And the Congress for Cultural Freedom was this effort to fund art and music and hijack the sentiments of revolutionary left-wing intellectuals. And in the, in the Eastern Bloc, there were a lot of young people, a lot of the most privileged young people in the Eastern Bloc, children of the party elite, you know, people with degrees and such to that effect, and the fact that the United States was associated with, with hippie counterculture and artistic freedom, the fact that the United States portrayed itself as this happy, happy, fun land, this, this free land of, of, you know, of rock music and all of that, the fact that the United States got out of the McCarthy period right, and hijacked culturally liberal sentiments, which before had been the Soviet's domain, that was very key. 
And that, you know, at the time of the fall of the USSR, right, you know, underground Beatles albums that people were, were buying, smuggling into the country, that was big. That was big. Um, you know, I, you know, the fact that, 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 uh, that, that Beatles music and counterculture and all of that, that played a very big role in the fall of, of the Soviet Union. And I talk about that in my book. And so I'm thinking there as I'm watching this, oh, the whole world blinks and forgets the Beatles. Does that mean the Soviet Union comes back? Because... Because you can't underestimate the role of rock music, the role of all of that in bringing down the Soviet Union. Um, and, and, you know, maybe that sounds like a long shot, but that's what I was thinking while I was watching the movie. Why? Because I think about politics all day long. I guess I'm a bit of a nerd. But, you know, it was, it was you know, I don't recommend it. It was, it was okay. It was an okay movie, interesting premise, kind of predictable in some ways. But there you go. Um, what else is new, folks? What else is on your mind? Um, I, there was a couple other things I wanted to say. Aha. Folks, so I saw that trending today on Twitter was the phrase white people against racism, which I think is great. I think there needs to be more white anti-racism out there. However, in the spirit of Twitter putting out white people against racism, I am going to criticize another work of art. And this is a work of art that I love, by the way. Beautiful novel that was made into a movie. Beautiful stuff. Um, and I enjoyed it. I loved it. I read the book uh, with my mother when I was, I was in like eighth grade. We read the book together. She had already read it. Um, I saw the movie. We then read it a couple years later in school. To Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill, to kill a Mockingbird. Aesthetically a great work. Just a great work of art about the Old South, about Jim Crow and the injustice of it, but I am going to criticize it. I'm going to criticize. I am going to now criticize To Kill a Mockingbird. That doesn't mean that I'm, I'm destroying your childhood you know, love for that book. It's a very beloved book. It's a young adult book, right? It's told from a child's perspective. It's a beautiful book, but, 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 politically it's problematic. Why? Folks, it takes place in the 1930s. Right, before the Second World War, during the Great Depression. The hero is a wealthy lawyer named Atticus Finch. And it's told from the perspective of his daughter, Scout. Um, and he's a lawyer and he defends an African-American man uh, who is charged with rape falsely. Um, and he's charged with raping a white woman. And despite the fact that the evidence overwhelmingly shows that this, this you know black man is not guilty of rape, he's convicted of it, um, and it's a tragedy, and it's, you know, it's a growing up story. The, do the girl is growing up in a world realizing that injustice exists. The, the, the Atticus Finch father character is portrayed as being, you know, just a man with a heart of gold. The whites in the book are portrayed as a bunch of racist rednecks, and that is the essence of the problem. During the 1930s, the slogan of the Communist Party USA, which was the vanguard of the anti-racist organization, before anyone had ever heard of Martin Luther King, Right? I mean, the Communist Party USA, that was, that was the party that W.E.B. Du Bois was in, uh, was friendly with. That was the party of Paul Robeson. That was the party of the Harlem Renaissance. That was the party of, of you know, I mean, that ran African Americans as vice presidential candidates. They were, they were the revolutionary. You can read, there's a book, Hammer and Ho, uh, History of the Communist Party of Alabama. Everyone knew that the Communist Party was the vanguard anti-racist organization. And what was the slogan of the Communist Party during the 1930s on regards to race? They said, black and white, unite and fight. And the Communist Party made more progress in fighting racism. And the way they did it was they said, and they told white workers, that racism hurts you by by stigmatizing and oppressing African Americans, by forcing African Americans to go to separate schools that are lower quality, by, by not allowing African Americans to drink out of the same drinking fountains, by, by, you know, the lynch terror regime where any black man could be killed extra legally for any reason, right? You know, where they would just have these mobs of people who would just kill black men. That hurt white workers. That was the message the Communist Party had. They said, obviously, racism is the worst for the people of color, but for white workers, it's no good for them. And the way out is solidarity. It's black and white, unite and fight. 
And the Communist Party actually built labor unions that were interracial. That was illegal at the time, mind you. In South Carolina, in Alabama, in, in Tennessee, in places like that, the Communist Party built interracial unions of textile workers. You should read about the, the, the Gastonia textile strike of 1928. Uh, you should read about the 1934 uh, you know, sharecroppers strikes that happened. And the Communist Party, their message to the white, the low-income white workers was that by joining in racism, you are helping the bosses. That was their message. And they, 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 the Communist Party did amazing things in the South during the 1930s. In 1934, they declared a state of emergency in South Carolina. And the, the National Guard was sent in because so many workers, white and black, were joining arm in arm together, demanding better conditions, demanding an end to Jim Crow segregation. But the way To Kill a Mockingbird portrays the race question is that it's the rich white people, the rich white people that are the friends of black people, and it's the white working class that are the racists and the rednecks, and that the educated white people, like Atticus Finch, who are wealthy, need to control those out-of-control rednecks. That's basically the message, and it's extremely problematic, and it's not what happened during the 1930s at all. Read Hammer and Ho. Read the history of the Communist Party. Read the memoirs of Angelo Herndon, one of the, the, the militant leaders of the Communist Party, an African-American man in Alabama. They tried to give him the death penalty just for handing out leaflets, right? They had a law in Alabama that it was illegal to incite black people to revolution. He was an African-American man. He was handing out leaflets saying, you know, the workers had to have a revolution, and they almost gave him the death penalty. Angelo Herndon. He was freed by the Supreme Court, thank goodness. But it was, it was a, I mean, the Communist Party in the South did amazing things amazing things. And they did it not by saying that the white workers are all in the Klan and we need these educated white rich people to come and, you know, tell, you know, fight for the black people and protect them from them, you know, those white trash rednecks. That wasn't the message at all. It was the rich white people that were the enemy. And the message was black and white unite and fight. And it was about solidarity. And that's how millions uh, millions of white workers were won to quit, to rip up their Ku Klux Klan cards. You can read about this, right? That, that they would, you know, that William Z. Foster or, or, you know, or Gus Hall would come to a town, you know, these were strong white workers and they would give a speech and, and white workers would just be in tears and they would realize that racism was something that ripped them out and they'd take their Ku Klux Klan membership card and they would rip it up, you know? That, that was what fought racism in the 1930s. Right? You know, it was black and white unite and fight. And the white workers weren't the enemy. The white workers weren't the enemy. And it wasn't the ruling class as a white savior protecting the black people from those racist whites. That was not what happened at all. That was not what happened at all. And, and the message of that book, the message of To Kill a Mockingbird, To Kill a Mockingbird was published in 1961, I believe. And the message of To Kill a Mockingbird is not what really happened in the 1930s in the South. The message of To Kill a Mockingbird is what, about what happened in the 1950s. It's about the civil rights movement. That's what it's about. It's about the civil rights movement, which was largely some of the richest people in the United States realizing that Jim Crow segregation hurt the United States economically and was a really, really p big problem in the face of the Soviet Union, right? When, in 1954, when Emmett Till was lynched, a young black man was killed for, for whistling at a white woman, allegedly. When that happened, um, you know, the Soviet Union took the picture, the photo of his body, and sent it all over the world and said, oh, the USA says they believe in democracy and freedom. Well, take a look at this picture, right? And there were the Kennedy family, and a lot of the northern wing of the Democratic Party, which was really, on some level, it was almost just a turf war because the Dixiecrats had been their rivals in the party for a long time. You know, the Dixiecrats, the solid south of the Democrats, the, they hated those folks. They couldn't stand them. The Kennedy family, these are Irish Catholics from the north. These are racist southern white guys and Klansmen in the south and the Democratic Party. The Kennedy family couldn't stand them. So it, it, you know, the fight against Jim Crow developed in the context of the Soviet Union using the race issue to humiliate and discredit the United States, number one, in the context of, of the, the Kennedy family and the northern wing of the Democratic Party being really, really tired and wanting to break the, the southern wing of the Democratic Party and strip them of their power because they were, they were corrupt and they had too much power and they, they, they made the Democratic Party do awful things. 
Um, for example, Harry Truman wanted to create national health insurance. Did you know that? Harry Truman wanted to create national health insurance, right? And, and in the 50s, the, or like coming out of World War II, late 40s, Harry Truman was saying, let's get national health insurance. Let's give everyone national health insurance. And then they sat down with their own party, not the Republicans, but their own party. And the Southern guys were like, what? You mean we have to have the same? You're going to build two hospitals, right? We're going to have a black hospital and a white hospital. That's how we do things in Alabama. And Truman and the Northern Wing of the Democratic Party said, there's no way, no way we are going to build two hospitals if we're having to pay for it out of the federal budget. And it was the Dixiecrats, the racist Jim Crow Democrats that destroyed national health care. Racism is bad for all of us. It's most especially bad for people of color, but it's bad for all of us. The reason we don't have national health care right now is because of racism, right? The Jim Crow Democratic Party you know, when Truman and the Democratic Party were getting ready to, to pass national health care, national health insurance in the late 40s, the Jim Crow Democrats sat there and they said, the only way we're going to support this is if you build segregated hospital. And they weren't going to do that. Right. The, uh, and they were not going to they were not going to have it. Right. And that 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 Jim Crow hurt the Democratic Party and the Kennedy family knew that it, it, they knew it. It was a big problem. And. And so there, the civil rights movement took place in the context of a section of the ruling class, a section of the most wealthy people in the United States, you know, kicking the ass of, of the southern wing of the ruling class that wanted to keep segregation. And, you know, that's what you see in To Kill a Mockingbird. Atticus Finch is a wealthy, educated man, and the people in his little southern town are a bunch of racist rednecks. And he's educated. And the way the black people are portrayed in the novel isn't particularly good either, right? You don't ever see them fighting for their own rights, you know? I mean, during that time, it was very common for the black people to take up arms against the Ku Klux Klan and form militias and defend themselves. But you didn't see that. That's not in the book, right? But it's this kind of white savior. The wealthy white savior goes to get those rabble rednecks in line. And it doesn't work, and it's so sad. And, and the book, you know, I mean, the book really plays into a white savior mentality, right? Atticus Finch is the wealthy, educated, good white person, right? And all the other whites, well, the white workers, are a bunch of uneducated white trash rabble. And then the black people are just victims, right? It's a problematic narrative. It's the narrative, largely, unfortunately, that was how the civil rights movement was in a lot of ways. There were a lot of very wealthy, college-educated people from other parts of the country, that saw the black people of the South purely as victims and saw the, the white working class of the South as uneducated white trash and went down there. And, and unfortunately, the narrative, I should say, of the civil rights movement, that wasn't the narrative of Martin Luther King. That wasn't the narrative, certainly, of, of Kwame Ture and, and Medgar Evers and a lot of the forces down there. But that was the narrative of white people who supported the civil rights movement. And To Kill a Mockingbird basically reflects the narrative of white people who supported the civil rights movement. And that's a problematic narrative. And it doesn't reflect what happened in the 1930s, which is the most untold story, the most untold story uh, of, of our time. What the Communist Party USA did in the 1930s is, is utterly amazing. I mean, you know, you, you need to read this history. The Communist Party... They are the ones that were beating the drum of anti-racism long before anybody else was, right? 1940, there's, I have video, I show it on my YouTube channel. James W. Ford uh, was the vice presidential nominee of the Communist Party. He was their vice presidential nominee in 1932. He was their vice presidential nominee in 1936. He was their vice presidential nominee in 1940. James W. Ford, an African-American man. And that's why in a lot of southern states they wouldn't allow the Communist Party on the ballot because their vice presidential candidate was black, right? And if you listen to him, you know, he says the Communist Party is, is, the, you know, is the friend of the African-American people. And, and, you know, the Socialist Party, you know, it had a lot of problems. It had a lot of problems, um, you know, on, on the race question. They were nowhere near where the Communist Party was. And... Let's also remember that up until 1956, the Communist Party didn't just say that, that you know, African Americans were discriminated against. The Communist Party actually maintained that African Americans were a nation. They were an oppressed nation within U.S. borders, right? And they, they argued that there was a black nation within the United States, a colonized people, right? Um, and that, I mean, you need to read this stuff, right? It wasn't until 1956 that the Communist Party officially dropped that position that black people were a nation, 
Um, and and so there's just so much that, that is missing today. So much that is missing. But I'm glad you're all here joining me. I'm having a great time. But if you haven't done it already, subscribe, number one. Subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. If you've already subscribed, hit the reminder button so you get reminders of all my upcoming lives. And if you haven't done it already, cut and paste and tweet this out. Make this a bigger conversation. The more of you, the more of you here, the better. I'm having a great time. We're talking about some great stuff. I got a, a lot of stuff to talk about today. I know you all have stuff you want me to talk about. You know, let's have some fun here, folks. I'm having a great time. It is Sunday evening, uh, you know, and we're, we're having a great time here. I hope you all are having fun. There, you know, there's a lot of us here tonight. Let's make it bigger. Let's, let's bring our friends in. Let's tweet this out. I'm having a great time. I'm going to read to you later from my new book. We're going to talk about a, a lot of different stuff. Um... But there you go. There you go. What else is new, folks? So now, this person who calls themselves Prometheus wants me to talk about the problems of, of the coming, you know, the coming economic problems of the United States. I've talked about this in many lives, but I will talk about it again. It needs to be said. It needs to be said. The problem is capitalism. And the problem with capitalism is that under capitalism, technology leads to greater poverty. The more efficient the means of production become, the better they are at building iPhones and iPads and, and all that kind of thing. The more efficient technology becomes under capitalism, the greater poverty exists. Right? There's workers' competition with machines. There is overproduction. And in fact, you know, I was going to read you another section of my book tonight, but you know what? Since since Prometheus, which I like your name, Prometheus. That's a great myth. You know, I, the story of Prometheus, I really like. Someone in a comment somewhere the other day said they attacked me. They said Caleb is a Promethean. Well, I'd I'd like to be a Promethean, right? That was Prometheus is the one who who fought for the right. You know, I mean, he, Zeus was trying to say humans couldn't have fire, and Prometheus stood up to the god Zeus and and made fire. Right? That's Prometheus. And you know, if I I mean, I w I would be proud to be a Promethean. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to read to you the section from my new book, City Builders and Vandals in Our Age. I'm going to read you the section from my new book about the pending economic crisis. It's already upon us, right? The first phase was 2008, 2009, but it's still not resolved. I'm going to read it to you. This is a section from my new book, City Builders and Vandals in Our Age. If you haven't ordered a copy, you really ought to get a copy. It's getting great reviews. I was on, you know, Sirius XM talking about it. Great interview. Got a lot. Of, I mean, my Twitter just lit up afterwards. I was on, uh, I was on Graham Elwood's show this week talking about it. You really ought to get a copy of City Builders and Vandals in Our Age. But anyhow, I'm going to read you a section from my book, City Builders and Vandals in Our Age, and I'm going to read slower. I know I have a tendency to talk very fast um, when I'm reading, so I'm going to try to read slower, um, and I'm going to read to you. Um, this section that will answer the question that Prometheus is asking about the economic crisis. Underlying the rising geopolitical tension is a big economic reality. Karl Marx published his magnum opus in 1867. It was a very lengthy work of economic research called Capital. The text was intended as volume one, with other volumes published after his death. The pages of Marx's Capital explain the basics of how an economy based on profits works. The chapters describe profits, surplus value, commodities and how their value is derived, and other key Marxist concepts. The climax is chapter 25 when Marx describes the general law of capitalist accumulation. Marx describes how the capitalist is constantly looking to expand profits so that these profits can be reinvested into expanding production and making greater profits to be invested once again. In the process of doing this, the capitalist aims to drive wages down in order to maximize profits. The capitalist is also looking to hire as few workers as possible, further reducing costs and eliminating jobs with technology. The result 
of what Marx described as workers competing with machines is a growing, quote, reserve army of labor, i.e. unemployed workers whose labor is not being exploited for profits. Marx referred to the ever-growing mass of unemployed workers as the reserve army of labor because the more people that are unemployed, the lower the wages as competition for jobs is more intensified. As Marx had explained in his earlier book, The Poverty of Philosophy, quote, from the day to day, it thus becomes clearer that the production relations in which the bourgeoisie moves have not a simple uniform character, but a dual character. That in the self-same relations in which wealth is produced, poverty is produced also. That in the self-same relation, relations in which there is development of productive forces, there is also a force producing repression. That in the relations, in the, that their relations produce bourgeois wealth, i.e. wealth of the bourgeois class, only by continually annihilating the wealth of individual members of this class and by producing an ever-growing proletariat. The great physicist Albert Einstein was deeply inspired by Marx's explanation of the problems of capitalist economics. This is Albert Einstein, folks, right? Apparently, you know, I, I've heard so many libertarians, this is, I'm not, this is not in the text, I'm editorializing here. A lot of libertarians say things like, oh, all, all Marxists are stupid. Oh, anyone who believes in Marxism is stupid. Well, Albert Einstein was stupid, right? I guess, right, you know what I mean? This is Albert Einstein reiterated Marx's concepts in his own words in an essay in 1949 uh, published uh, called Why Socialism? Explaining Marx's analysis, Einstein wrote, production is carried out for profits, not for use. There is no provision that those able and willing to work will always be in a position to find employment. An army of unemployed always exists. The worker is constantly in fear of losing his job. Since unemployed and poorly, poorly paid workers do not provide a profitable market, the production of consumer goods is restricted and great hardship is the consequence. Technological progress frequently results in more unemployment rather than in easing the burden of work for all. The profit motive in conjunction with competition among capitalists is responsible for an instability in the accumulation and utilization of capital, which leads to increasingly severe depressions. Unlimited competition leads to a huge waste of labor and to that crippling of social consciousness of individuals. In systems of the past, people became hungry due to food shortages. Only under the system of production for profit do people become hungry because too much food exists? In systems of the past, people were homeless due to shortages of housing. But in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, spurned by the bursting of the housing bubble, millions of Americans lost their homes and many even became homeless because too much housing existed. While the ability of the public to purchase it had vastly decreased. Famous dialogue between a recently unemployed Polish coal miner and his son, published in 1930, illustrates the problem of capitalist production. Father, why don't we light the stove? I am cold. We don't have any coal, son. And why haven't we got any coal? Because there is too much coal. The problem of overproduction, poverty amidst plenty, is the built-in failure of the capitalist system. It is something that endless efforts by capitalist governments, central bankers, fiat money printers, and others have never been able to resolve. As long as the means of production function simply as preliminary transformation into capital, growth will be restricted and cyclical crises will prevail. However, the situation currently facing the global economy is of a distinctly different character. Artificial intelligence 
has taken the automation of labor to a new level, unforeseen by Marx in 1867. In the modern era, the worker is not seeing his wages driven down by technology, and technology is not erasing a skilled trade or an industrial position here and there. Rather, the defining change of our time is the worker being eliminated from production and even from the service sector. In essence, the computer revolution is almost eliminating the working class. While Marx described workers in capitalism as being reduced from skilled craftsmen to being merely appendages of machines, in the 21st century, machines are being stripped of their appendages. As Jack Ma, the Chinese Communist Party member and tech billionaire put it, we made people like machines, and now we make machines like people. In the 21st century apparatus of production, workers are not needed. Assembly line factory workers are being relegated to history books. Computers are now armed with artificial intelligence and are better at trading stocks, printing books, and doing almost any manufacturing or service task. As U.S. presidential candidate Andrew Yang explained in an interview with the New York Times, quote, all you need is self-driving cars to destabilize society. We're going to have a million truck drivers out of work who are 94% male with an average level of education of high school or one year of college. That one innovation will be enough to create riots in the streets. And we're about to do the same thing with workers, with retail workers, call center workers, fast food workers, insurance companies, and accounting firms. That's Andrea Yang. The global apparatus of production centered around Wall Street and London, churns out products more efficiently than ever before. As millions and millions are cast into poverty, refugees pile into the United States from Latin America, from North Africa into Europe, from Southeast Asia and the Pacific into the Middle East. The Global Reserve Army of Labor is growing and manifesting itself in a crisis of mass migration. The increasingly desperate masses of the global south manifest their poverty with the growth of terrorist groups and drug cartels. The Arab Spring of 2011 was effectively hijacked and controlled by Washington's covert efforts, but the anger and desperation underlying it has not disappeared. The problem is global, and the desperation is real. The greatest crisis of overproduction in the history of capitalism is now unfolding. The final conflict is upon us, and the Gotadamerung is approaching for the vandal gods of finance and empire. The means of production can no longer be allowed to function in an irrational way. The need for the centers of economic power to be controlled by society is no longer a matter of making human life easier, but a matter of preserving humanity itself. So that is the section for my new book about what is causing the global crisis in the economy. Why are we having economic problems? Well, technology under capitalism does not lead to greater wealth, it leads to greater poverty. More abundance creates greater poverty when you have an irrational system based on profits. In times past, people were hungry because there wasn't enough food. In the current times, people are hungry because there is too much food. That's capitalism. And that's a section from my book, City Builders and Vandals in Our Age. And it's something that can't really be addressed. I have seen libertarian videos or right-wing videos desperately trying to explain the theory of the falling rate of profits and bumblingly getting it wrong. They don't get this. 
The problem is, the problem is really this. Sometimes I have to just break it down like a math teacher or something. All right, here we are. So let's say, let's say we have a factory that makes pencils, right? It's pencils, right? Right, it's always pencils, right? So we have a pencil factory and we sell every pencil for $1. So the price of the pencil is $1. The pencil costs $1. Let's say the materials for the pencil cost a quarter. The materials for the pencil cost 25 cents, right? And let's say that the labor, you pay a worker 25 cents, right? They get paid 25 cents for, for the, you know, assembling the pencil. So, the total cost of the pencil is $1. So, with the, the materials are 25 cents, right? The materials are 25 cents. The cost of labor is 25 cents. And the employer is going to make this rate of profit. It's going to be 50 cents per pencil. Right? So, total cost is $1. Labor cost 25 cents. Uh, the, the material costs 25 cents. Total profits for the employer will be 50 cents. But here's the problem. $0.25 cents is not equal to $1. Twenty-five cents is not equal to one dollar. That pencil costs one dollar. But the worker has only been paid twenty-five cents. And with twenty-five cents, the worker can never buy the pencil. Workers are also consumers. And no matter what, in order for the capitalist to make a profit, there is no way, there is no way that labor can ever afford to buy what it produces. 25 cents can never equal a dollar. There is no way that we, the working class, who sell our labor power to a boss, can ever afford to buy back the products that we are producing. It's not mathematically possible. And that is the problem of capitalist production. And that's what Karl Marx spent his entire life laying out and explaining. There is no way we can buy back the products that we produce. The capitalist is constantly looking to drive down the wages of the worker. And as a result, the worker can't afford to buy back the product. And even if the capitalist wasn't trying to constantly drive, in order for the capitalist production to function the way it does, production for profit, there is no way there is no way at the end of the day you're not going to be stuck with a bunch of pencils that no one can buy. The working class cannot buy back what it produces. That's the problem of capitalism. So it constantly needs a new market to dump those products on. Because the working class cannot buy back the products it's producing. And that's the problem of overproduction. That's the problem of capitalism. The working class can never buy back the products it produces. So, there you go. I hope that answers Prometheus's question about why the capitalist economy has all the problems that it has. I'm going to see what else is... What else did I have? I'm going to have to flip back in my book here. Okay. So, we already talked about GDP growth. I already talked about Saudi Arabia, Lion King, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Beatles music. All right, what else is on people's minds? Right, we just had an interesting comment on on uh, you know about economics. I kind of went off that for a little while. I first uh, read the section from my book. From there, I ended up talking about the 
the built-in problem of overproduction, I ended up laying it out in, in terms of mathematics. Um, there's a couple things I wanted to talk about. Um, one thing I noticed is that uh, Donald Trump seems to be fighting with Silicon Valley. Uh, he's now accusing uh, Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg of being sympathetic to China, um, number one. Uh, furthermore, uh, um, at this point, you know, the Justice Department is now investigating Silicon Valley, the tech companies, for being monopolies. Um, and it seems to me that Silicon Valley, um, Silicon Valley represents a particular wing of the American ruling class. It's tied to the intelligence agencies. In fact, you can Google this. I mean, and it's weird. You say this kind of thing to people. You say to people that Silicon Valley and the computer revolution was, was, a, was the work of the CIA. And people look at you like, oh my God, you know, where's your tinfoil hat? Oh, did the space aliens tell you that? Google it, right? That actually it's one of the most successful things the intelligence agencies did is set up and channel the money to create, you know, they saw that the Soviet Union didn't have the resources. You know, they, they had the innovation, they had the skills, they just didn't have the resources to keep up with the computer revolution. And we weren't sharing technology with them because of the treaties. And so the CIA and the intelligence agencies worked really hard to push a lot of money into Silicon Valley. And, you know, and, and it didn't stop after the end of the Cold War. The intelligence agencies, they really pushed for the creation of Google. They really pushed for the creation of, of different things. And those links are, you know, look it up, right? The NSA, the, the, the CIA, the various intel agencies have a lot to do with Silicon Valley, right? And because of that, Right, Because of that, they seem to be particularly tied to a faction of the ruling elite of the United States that is tied to the intelligence agencies. That faction being the Ford Foundation, the Rockefellers, that wing, right? the, the big oil companies, that wing of American capital. Um, you, know, you know, that seems to be where the sympathies of Silicon Valley lie. Meanwhile, it seems like Trump is more tied to fracking companies. He's more tied to, you know, you know, folks in the ruling class like Betsy DeVos who feel like they're not part of the club. Where did Betsy DeVos's money come from? Came from Amway, right? Selling Tupperware. She's not part of the, the club. She's not in with Rockefeller. She's a billionaire, but she's not part of the club, right, of these entrenched ruling circles. Now, there are divides. There are divides between the ruling class, and if you look at the entities, you know, that are tied with the National Endowment for Democracy, or tied with the, um, you know, the Silicon Valley folks, or tied in with, uh, you know, with the, with the Ford Foundation and the CIA, those folks have one agenda, and it seems that Trump is on the other side. He was closer to the Pentagon, and it's interesting to note uh, that, you know, also the Bernie Sanders wing seems to not be in with that faction either. You'll notice that Bernie Sanders is also calling up for the, for the investigation and the breaking up of tech monopolies. Um, but what is interesting, though, what is interesting is that when Hillary Clinton was running the State Department during the Obama administration, right, when she was running the State Department for Obama, Silicon Valley and the State Department worked closer than ever before. They worked hand in hand like you wouldn't believe. Seriously. Um, for example, there was an individual by the name of uh, Jared Cohen. And Jared Cohen was on the board of Google Alphabet. And during the Arab Spring, openly, this is openly admitted, right? Not a secret. Look up Jared Cohen. During the Arab Spring, he was a State Department employee who was coordinating social media for the State Department. He was, was making sure that everything went right when people were out in the streets and you know the, 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 the protests against the government of Libya, the protests against the government of Syria. Jared Cohen was in the State Department in 2011 and, and he was on the board of Google, Alphabet, at the same time, right? This is not a secret. Um, and that, that, that wing of the ruling class, that, those wealthy families, that entrenched circle, those folks that are, that are in with the CIA, that are in with uh, the Ford Foundation, that are in with Silicon Valley, that faction that you can call it, the New England Establishment, that's what a lot of people have referred to him as, the New England Establishment, that axis, Rockefeller, Ford Foundation, um, Silicon Valley, uh, Hillary Clinton, DNC, that wing of things, the folks that are now supporting Kamala Harris, that axis represents probably, I would say, the most dangerous section of the ruling class of the United States right now. I mean, we saw what happened, you know, when Hillary Clinton was running the State Department. You know, that wing, 
That represents probably the most dangerous faction. And they're not Bernie Sanders liberals. They're not social Democrats. They're not Democratic Socialists. But they're not Trump people either. They are a particular faction. They're liberals in the sense that there's, they're Malthusians. They think there's too many people in the world, right? They're liberals in the sense uh, that they, uh, they, you know, they, they think there's too many, they believe in global warming, too many people in the world. They're liberals in the sense that they want to utilize, you know, you know, the oppression of LGBT people to justify sanctions and wars. Uh, they're liberals in the sense that they want to perhaps have things be more stable in the United States so they can focus on building a global empire, and if that means having a social program here and there. But at the end of the day, the end of the day, they represent you know, they represent the most effective and the most entrenched power in the United States. And they are the folks that brought us libertarianism, mind you. Ayn Rand was promoted like crazy by the Ford Foundation and the Ford Hall Forum. 1972, Ayn Rand spoke at the Ford Hall Forum, right? Um, and, and, you know, the same people, the same people that brought us, you know, you know, MK Ultra and, and drugs also brought us, I kid you not, they also brought us they also brought us Ayn Rand. They also brought us Milton Friedman. Where was Milton Friedman presented, right? Where, Milton Friedman did a TV miniseries, right? Free to choose, promoting his free market, deregulate, privatize everything garbage. Where was it screened? On PBS. And look at who paid for it. Brought to you by the Ford Foundation, right? That's who these folks are, right? They are the more effective evil. They are Harvard and Yale. They are, and that's the folks that brought us Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger was a Rockefeller creation from the beginning. This is the more effective evil. This is the most effective evil. This is the long-standing entrenched power of, of wealth in the United States. These, this is the New England establishment. This is the oil banking elite. These are the people that brought us Silicon Valley. This is the deep state ruling class. This is who I'm talking about. That particular faction. The, that at this point is around the DNC. They loved Bush, you know, they, they, they liked Bush. They didn't have a problem with Bush, right? The James Comey wing, right? James Comey, all of them, you know, the, the, that wing, right? That, that is now at this point in the Democratic Party, probably only because of the fact that demographics are changing in the United States. They know that, right? They know that the United States is increasingly becoming more and more a, a, a country that is less white and people of color. It's more and more in urban areas. You know, the, the population is moving into urban centers. They see the trends, so now they're Democrats. They would have been Republicans during the Bush years. They would have been Republicans during the Reagan years. But they were, you know, it's that wing, that New England establishment, right? That Rockefeller, DuPont, Vanderbilt, Carnegie, um, you know, that wing of American capital, right? You talk about the six families. Do people ever talk about the six families anymore? During the Great Depression, everybody knew about the six families that ruled the United States. Rockefeller, Carnegie, DuPont, Mellon, right? Mellon. Um, I'm trying to think. There was a couple other ones. It was the six families. I don't even know them now, but everybody knew the six families, right? These are the people. These are the people that have astronomical amounts of power. And Silicon Valley is theirs, and the intelligence agencies are theirs. The Morgans, right? Kinky says J.P. Morgan, and she's right about that. The Morgans, the Vanderbilts, right, right. This, these are this is this is the wing. This is the most evil wing of the establishment. Okay, folks, I'm just I'm saying that, and I'm not getting Trump off the hook. Trump disgusts me. That send her back stuff, the anti-immigrant bigotry. No one here is supporting Donald Trump, but I'm telling you, folks, the most evil faction in the United States, the most evil faction is that New England establishment. These people, these people have evil down to a science. They know how to overthrow governments. They know how to reduce countries economically to rubble. Um, I mean, if you want to know what these people are about, I mean, I mean, this is evil, right? These are the folks that brought us Ayn Rand. They brought us Milton Friedman. These are the folks that believe that, that compassion is weakness. Right? That if you care about other people, that's, that's weakness. That's something we need to breed out of us. Right? We all need to be compassionless, hateful creatures. These are people that believe we need to drastically reduce the human population. They're talking about reducing the human population by half. There's just too many of us in the world. We need to reduce the human population. That's who these people are. Right? This, that New England establishment. Right? 
and yes, you know, the Rothschilds are, are in with them, sure, but it's, it's, you know, you say Rothschilds, people say anti-Semitism. Most of these ruling families are not Jewish, and if you want to make it about Jews, that's anti-Semitism. This is not about race, this is not about ethnicity, okay? This is about certain circles of wealth, mainly tied in with big oil, mainly tied in with banks, and now tied in with the intel agencies more than anything. This is finance capital. This is the lifeblood of Wall Street. This is not the lower level insider trading guys. This isn't Wall Street stockbrokers and all of that. This is, this is the lifeblood of Wall Street. This is J.P. Morgan Chase. This is Goldman Sachs, right? This is Citibank. This is GEO Group. This is, this is Bank of America. Those folks right? The, the financial center of, of Western power that is very closely tied in with Britain. That's where the Rothschilds are at. They're in Britain. They're not, they're not based in the United States. That's where BP is at. That's where HSBC Bank, a whole bank set up for the purpose of, of hooking Chinese people on opium so that they could be subjugated and, and oppressed, right? This, this is the center, the wing of the American establishment that is the most dangerous. And they are in the process right now of trying to roll back human history. I kid you not, they are talking about overpopulation. They're talking about how there's just too many people in the world. And they really, I mean, if you, if you want to see what, the, what these folks have in store for the world, look at South America in the 90s, before the rise of the Bolivarian socialist movement, before Hugo Chavez, before Evo Morales. Look at South America in the 1990s. Look at Bolivia, where it was a crime. It was a crime to collect water on your roof. It was, a, it was a crime to collect water on your rooftop. It was. It was a crime to collect water on your rooftop because the water of Bolivia had been sold to American corporations. About in Venezuela during the, the, the 1990s, all right, the government would lay off all kinds of government workers and the power plants and the sanitation facilities. And every year they'd go back. They needed these development loans. And so they would go back to you know, the development loans, and they'd say, oh, you got to lay off more people. And it got to the point that whole neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods in Venezuela didn't have electricity for weeks. Not because the power plant didn't work, just the government just didn't have the money and it laid off the workers. And it, I mean, it, it was unbelievable. Garbage wouldn't be collected. In poor neighborhoods, I mean, what we're talking about here with neoliberalism, economic neoliberalism, economic neoliberalism wedded with social liberalism, right? Right? Free markets, privatize everything, gut the standard of livings, uh, you know, have one giant global economy or an open international system. That's another brilliant one from Hillary Clinton's State Department. Anne Marie Slaughter loves that open international system, right? That open international system that has destroyed my home state of Ohio, it's destroyed Pennsylvania, it's destroyed Michigan. Right? That open international system where the whole world gets poorer and wealth concentrates in the hands of a few bankers. That system, that open international system, right? That's what these people are about. And that is the most dangerous wing. And their, their woman right now is Kamala Harris, right? Kamala Harris, this, this is a, a woman who, who, I mean, took pleasure in destroying the lives of innocent people. You know, I mean, she, I kid you not, she, she was, you know, false, you know, she, she was caught, you know, not turning over evidence and working hard like crazy to keep innocent people in jail. She is a, a, a person without a moral compass whom they can, they can manipulate, who they see as their woman, right? And she can, she's a demagogue. She, she can tell touching stories and, oh, they love Kamala Harris, right? And, and, you know, in California with Kamala Harris, I mean, you know, people talk about huge prison populations and all of that. They want to do, you know, and look at California right now. Look at the homelessness problem they have in California right now. Yeah, they're letting people out of jail at this point. Governor Jerry Brown finally started letting people out of jail because the prison population was so ridiculous. Um, right. But look at California and the huge prison population they have there. Right. Huge prison population or huge homeless population now. Right. They're letting them out of jail. It used to be a huge prison population, now a huge homeless population. All kinds of poverty, but dressed up in talk of white privilege and, you know, gender oppression and 
and all the liberal buzzwords and identity politics while we build a giant prison and we start taking people's jobs away and wages go down and people are ground into poverty and homeless people are out on the street begging and we've got a prison state but you know that prison state uses the correct pronouns and it's sympathetic and and what are they starting to do now folks what are they starting to do now they're starting to introduce the idea that if you think outside the establishment, you're mentally ill. I kid you not, they're starting that now, right? That was, that was something they always accused the Soviet Union of doing, right? Of, of, of using the mental health system to, to silence uh, dissidents. Well, now we're starting to see that, right? That if you, you know, if you question you know, the fact that capitalism is the best system in the world, you start looking at the articles, start reading the articles, right? Read the articles. Shout out to Ramiro, who's joining us. Long time. Read the articles, right? Read what they're doing now. The increasing mental health culture, right? Where, you know, the amount of people that are taking medications is through the roof. They're increasingly setting the stage where it's, it's going to be that if you don't think, that if you don't think that capitalism is the greatest system, if you don't think that the USA invading Syria and overthrowing Bashar Assad would be the best darn thing in the world, you're crazy. You're mentally ill and you need to get to a hospital. You need to be medicated because clearly, you know, you don't play well with others, you know, and they won't be mean about it, right? You know, they're not, they're not like the, uh, they're not like the Trump people, right? It, it's, you know, they're going to be friendly about it. They're going to talk about white privilege and mansplaining. They're going to talk to you in this nice little voice, and they're going to start locking people up in prison in big numbers. You broke the law, or, you know, or, yeah, yeah, it's, it's scary, right? I'm telling you, the most evil wing of the American ruling class, as, as Black Agenda Report famously coined the term, the more effective evil, the more effective evil, it, it's this faction. It is that New England faction. They are dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. They are dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. They have a left side to them. They're into social liberalism. They have a right-wing side. They're into economic neoliberalism and free markets and libertarian privatizations. They have multiple sides to them, but they hate socialism. They hate socialism, and they hate the American working class. Whether you're black, white, they want the standard of living here to drop, and they want the world population to be cut in half. There's too many people in the world. There's too many workers. We don't need them anymore. We got machines. We got computers. I'm telling you, folks, this is who we're up against. That DNC wing of things, very, very, very dangerous. And that doesn't mean I support Trump. I don't. And these people hate Bernie Sanders far more than they hate Trump. Far more, right? But, you know, when Bernie Sanders speaks and talks about the need for a mass movement and people struggling for justice, that scares them more than anything. Trump can rile up the rabble in Ohio and Pennsylvania, you know, but, but that doesn't scare them as much as what Bernie Sanders is saying scares them. Doesn't scare them as much as what, you know, as, as what Tulsi Gabbard is saying when she exposes their ugly wars, right? This wing of the American ruling class is, is very, very dangerous. And I'm just telling you, folks... I'm telling you how I see it. I'm telling you the analysis. There's a lot of facts that don't get highlighted. We don't know who all these factions are. We think it's all just a, a struggle of, of personalities. Kinky's pointing out, you know, someone said that Bernie makes the skin crawl. Why would Bernie make the skin crawl? You know? You know, you see Kathy Griffin very nervously on there talking against Bernie Bros. Oh, Bernie Bros are bad. They're they're awful. I don't like the Bernie, you know, you know. There's a particular faction here. There is a particular faction here. Kamala Harris is their woman. She's their woman, and they, they, they don't like Trump, but they really don't like Bernie Sanders, and they are the face of evil. I'm telling you that. Look at who was in Hillary Clinton's State Department. Anne-Marie Slaughter, Jerry, Jared Cohen, right? You know, Samantha Power, the genocide chick. She jokingly calls herself the genocide chick. This is scary stuff, folks. These are scary people. And, you know, and if you talk about this, people are like, oh, there you go, there you go. You know, these are very, very scary folks. This is, this is the intel agencies. This is Silicon Valley. Um, but there you go. There you go, folks. So I am kind of, I'm, I'm at the end of what I got to say here. Um, but I know some of you guys have other things to say. What else is on your mind, folks, before we wrap up here? I've been going for a little while. What's on your mind? 
What's on your mind? What's on your mind? Anything else? Great analysis. Thank you, Kinky. I do my best. Um, Bernie is one of the best guys, but not perfect. I agree. I'm very critical of Bernie Sanders in terms of foreign policy. That was Blood Money LLC. And I am very critical of Bernie's foreign policy. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on modern day labor unions in the U.S.? Well, you know, they the labor movement, you know, at this point is is very weak. Um, and but because of that, they have actually had to put on kind of a more left wing face. I've noticed that. Um, you know, and and we saw that. I mean, that that developed a couple years ago. They're doing things that are a little more radical than they would have done maybe a decade ago, and it's because they're in such a weak spot, and they need to motivate their base. They need more activism, um, and so the labor unions are are putting out a more far left line than we've ever seen. You know, there was a bit of a shift in the 1990s uh, during neoliberalism. We saw DSA, um, Democratic Socialists of America, move in and kind of sweep, you know, seize control of the labor bureaucracy. Um, I'm trying to remember his name, but there was an individual who was the head of the AFL-CIO in the 1990s, and he was in the DSA. And DSA actually, you know, it was it was a left sweep, but it was because the unions were under attack. Uh, Ron Carey ran the labor, uh, the Teamsters Union, and then there was uh, this individual, John Sweeney was his name, John Sweeney, who was in DSA, became the head of the AFL-CIO. And there was a shift in the 90s slightly to the left. But what we're seeing now is a really big shift among labor, right? And they're doing things they haven't done in a long time. They're talking much more of a left game than they've talked before. Is it translating into actual activism? I don't see non-union workers in, you know, I don't see McDonald's being unionized all around the country. I don't see non-union workers, um, you know, being organized into unions, all the call centers and stuff. I don't see them all being unionized. So... You know, I don't see Walmarts being shut down by sit-down strikes. I mean, I don't think they're, they're certainly not in like a, a revolutionary phase. It's not the 1930s. This isn't the, the, this is nothing like what the Communist Party USA did. But they are talking more left than they used to be, right? Um, you know, I remember back in, uh, right after Obama won the presidential election, we were all really excited. I went to Chicago with my roommate and, and a couple other people. We drove to Chicago. We got a phone call from the political party we were in. You know, there was a sit-down strike at the Republic Window and Door Makers. Remember that? And we, you know, we gotten we were in Cleveland and we hopped in a car and we drove, drove to Chicago to support the Republican Window and Door Makers strike. And that was big, um, but there wasn't a big sit-down strike wave, though, right? And imagine what would have happened, right? When when President Roosevelt said that sit-down strikes were legal, and and called on workers to seize their factories, basically, in his his radio addresses, that was big. And Obama didn't do that, right? Obama, you know, uh, you know, they kind of, you know, there was kind of a little bit of an upsurge from the AFL-CIO, but uh, didn't happen the way people thought it would. But that was, it was an interesting moment. But, you know, you look at what Roosevelt did. 1937, there was an economic crisis, right? Um, you know, and basically the employers were laying people off in, res in response to Roosevelt getting elected, getting reelected. And so Roosevelt said, go and occupy your factory. And all across the country, every corner of the country practically you know it started in ohio among the rubber workers but it soon spread to the flint sit down strike of, of michigan all around the country workers were occupying their factories they weren't standing outside with picket signs they were seizing their plants you know workplace occupations swept the country the sit down strike wave of 1937 was big and it was in response to a president you know roosevelt who was facing opposition and the threat of a fascist coup you know, the ruling class was trying to remove him. In response, he became a left-wing Bonapartist, and he aligned himself with the progressive movement. No, FDR was not a communist. He was not. In the final years of his life, he was approaching social democracy. The final years of his life, he kind of, if you read his final speeches, he was starting to sound a little bit like a social democrat, but he never really even became a social democrat. Um, you know, Roosevelt was a Bonapartist. He was a, a member of the ruling class who was being threatened by his own class and made strategic alliances with the working class. Um, you know, and Roosevelt made a strategic alliance. He had communists sleep over at the White House. He had Gilbert Green from the Young Communist League sleep over at the White House. He, you know, he, he you know, invited, you know, uh, all kinds of labor unions. The guy who was the head of the sleeping car porters union, one of the main African-American unions at the time, uh, he invited him to the White House. Roosevelt, you know, he had a left turn 
He had a left turn in response to being attacked. But then let's remember also that, that you know, that when when the Soviet Union, you know, when they signed the, the Nazi-Soviet, or the, it should be the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the 1939 pact, you remember Roosevelt imprisoned. He imprisoned Earl Browder, the leader of the Communist Party, and he cracked down on the communists. And then when the World War II started, he pardoned them and let them all out of jail. But it, it's very complicated, right? It's, it's complicated. Henry Wallace, who became the vice president under Roosevelt in 1936, or I believe in 1940, actually. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, Henry Wallace, who was, you know, I mean, he was he was a socialist, more or less. He was had been around the Socialist Party. Was not a communist, as Jenny Lynn points out. But yeah, I mean, the Roosevelt administration entered his strategic alliance with communists um, because of its own needs and because of the, the crisis. And that opened the door to a lot of amazing things happening. It really did. I mean, that Eleanor Roosevelt, even, even, and that was the thing, right? You know, the Jim Crow wing of the Democratic Party was very big, but even the communists were such a big faction that Eleanor Roosevelt started doing anti-racist things. And Franklin Roosevelt would distance himself from her, right? He'd say, oh, I don't agree with that, you know, but that was, that was big, right? Um, you know, and Eleanor Roosevelt was very, you know, and, and the communists, you know, there was a guy who was in Congress, in the House of Representatives, named Vito Marcantonio. He was considered a fellow traveler of the Communist Party. He would introduce an anti-lynching bill, right? And Eleanor Roosevelt had made some statements supporting him, but, you know, it would be, always be voted down because the Democrats, that Jim Crow wing of the Democratic Party that I mentioned before, had too much power. Um, it's, it's complicated history here, folks. Uh, next live I do, I can't do it tonight, but the next live I do, I'm going to talk about the new communist movement, the NCM, right? Because that's important. That history of the 1970s, where all the 60s radicals went into the plants and tried to form kind of communist, uh, communist factions among the working class. You had the rise of some of the Maoist groups. I think there's some interesting history there, the new communist movement of the 1970s. It ultimately failed, but there's a lot that can be learned from it. I want to talk about that and, and what, what went on with that. But I'll, that'll be in another live, folks. I'm getting tired. It's been great. Um, I'm glad you all are here. Um, a, lot, a lot of good topics we're talking about. But remember, we are a community here. We are a community here. There's a lot of us. And, you know, we are having conversations here that are way beyond, you know, I'm not sitting here with a little microphone going, these bleeping corporations have too much bleeping money. I can't stand it. I mean, what's the deal? Bleep them, these racist bleeping, bleeping, bleepingers. Yeah, I mean, I'm not doing that, right? That's your typical Bernie bro podcast, you know, and we love them. I watch some of them, but that's not what we're doing here. We're doing something more exciting here. We're talking about ancient Greece and Rome. We're talking about the six families. We're talking about overproduction and Marx. We're, we are on a totally different level. We are on a totally different level than certain names that I will not name. And, you know, we're, 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 we're doing something special here. You know it and I know it. But at the end of the day, we all know that what we need now is a government of action to fight for working families. We need a government of action to fight for working families. We need a government of action to fight for working families. We need a government of action that will fight for working families. We need a government of action to fight for working families, right? Capitalism, neoliberalism, they say, hey, get the government off our backs. The government's the best that governs least. But all the people in the United States that are suffering right now, that are seeing their neighborhoods destroyed by opioids, that are seeing unpaved roads, that are seeing a police state on the horizon, that are facing a lifetime in low-wage service sector jobs, what they need more than ever is a government of action, a government of action that will fight for working families. We've got to be past judging politicians by what they say. We need action. We need a government of action to fight for working families. And that said... That said, now someone's saying I should go on Rev Left Radio anytime, you know. Hey, I'll do it. Message me, Facebook message, Twitter message me. I'll do it anytime. I went on with Graham Elwood. Uh, you know, I, I went on Sirius XM. You, Rev Left Radio, you want to have me? I'll do it. I'll happily do it. I know you don't agree with me, and that's fine. I don't agree with you either. We all disagree with each other. But I'm saying what needs to be said, which is that we need a government of action to fight for working families. We need a government of action to fight for working families. And on that note, I will end the way I ended last week because it was just poetic. I don't know why, but the last statement 
of Mao Zedong, the last official statement of Chairman Mao Zedong, the leader of the Chinese Revolution. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression, but the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression, and the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, but revolution is the main trend in the world today. Let me repeat that last line. The danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared. But revolution is the main trend in the world today. And I will end, I will repeat that last line one more time. The danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared. But revolution is the main trend in the world today. And on that note, I'm out. I love you all. We're doing something really special here. We really are. No one else is doing what we're doing. You knew about Marx a long time, a long time. You knew about Marx and Lincoln long before anyone who reads the Washington Post did. When you saw the Washington Post run that article about Marx and Lincoln, you thought, oh, they've caught up with all of us on Caleb's Live. Oh, they caught up with Kinky and Jenny Lynn and JT24 and Civic Matters. Oh, and Ramiro, you know, they, everyone who watches this live knew about Marx and Lincoln long before the Washington Post readership did. We are the vanguard. We are ahead of the game. We're ahead of the game. We're a community here. If you're part of these lives, you are in on something special. We are on a different level. The mainstream media, the mainstream socialist movement is playing catch up with what we're doing here. We're ahead of the game. You know it. Be proud that you're part of this community. Tweet this out. Spread the word. Until next time, I'm out.